this is a chap called Michael Franzisi. He was uh, in the mafia, born into a uh, mobster family. He went to prison himself. His father went to prison. Uh, he was born into the mafia. And at one stage in his life, uh, when he was running various different illegal schemes, he was making up to $8 million a week with his various different business ventures. He'd been to prison a, a number of times for various different offenses, fraud and the like. But despite all the money that he'd made, despite the lifestyle that he was living, he wasn't happy. He wasn't content. He felt empty. He knew there was something missing. And one day he met a Christian. And he realized as he met this uh, woman who is a Christian that she had this sort of inner contentment, this sort of inner peace that he desired. And it set him on a journey. And one day, eventually, he finally became a Christian. And now from instead of being a mobster in the mafia, he's now an inspirational speaker. He's an author. He goes around sharing his faith in Jesus. It's a pretty dramatic conversion to being from in the mafia to being a speaker and evangelist for Jesus. Who would you think in the world now would be perhaps the most surprising conversion, perhaps the most dramatic conversion of all? Maybe you think Vladimir Putin, or perhaps you'd think Boris Johnson, or perhaps you think of somebody who's sort of got everything, Cristiano Ronaldo. And yet even those conversions, even someone like Richard Dawkins, pales into comparison to what we see in Acts chapter 9. Perhaps the most dramatic, the most sudden conversion of all, which changed the course of the history of the church and really changed the course of human history, certainly of Western civilization. We're going to see three things uh, this evening as we look at this passage. First of all, a sudden conversion, a sudden conversion. Now, we need a bit of context as we're going through the book of Acts. Uh, last week, we saw uh, Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. We'd seen two things happening. we have seen the gospel going out, the gospel spreading to various different parts. We've seen people becoming Christians, but we've also seen persecution. We've seen opposition. We've seen the church being opposed. You can see that at the end of chapter 7, at 7.59. This is the stoning of Stephen. They were stoning Stephen. Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep, he died. And Saul approved of their killing him. Now, Saul was a persecutor, and he approved of the killing of Stephen. In fact, verse 58 of that chapter uh, makes it clear that Saul is there. He's part of this mob. He's part of this group that is killing, stoning Stephen. It's really important that we have that context. Saul is somebody who opposes the gospel, who kills Christians. And of course, in chapter 7, we're told that as Stephen uh, lays down his life, as Stephen is, is murdered, he has this vision of the Lord Jesus. He prays out, he calls out to this vision of the Son of Man in heaven, uh, standing at the right hand of the Father, Jesus in, the, in all his glory. And of course, Saul hears that. Saul doesn't believe that to be true at that point, uh, but he hears Stephen's preaching. Stephen's preaching is not going to be in vain. We're going to see something happening. Uh, but by the time of chapter 9, our passage uh, this evening, uh, Saul, uh, verse 1, is breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, even going asking for letters, letters of indictment, so that he can kill even more Christians. Saul is on a journey that he's an opponent of the gospel, but not just an opponent of the gospel, so much so that he actually wants to kill Christians. He hates Jesus. He hates the gospel uh, so much. He hates the church to such a degree that he's not just anti-gospel, he's sort of pro-killing them, going from place to place to murder God's people. Of course, this is something uh, that perhaps is beyond our experience, but not beyond the experience of many people in the world today. Even this past week, I saw on the Barnabas Fund website, information about an Iranian pastor who'd been sentenced to 10 years imprisonment for pastoring a church, dragged from his home. We know people in our church family who've been uh, taken from their home, having to leave their country. We know that there are Christians who are murdered, 
And that was what Saul uh, was doing here, going from home to home, place to place, dragging Christians off uh, so that they uh, could be murdered. He hated Christians, and Christians feared him. But of course, all that was going to change, wasn't it? Uh, he had a road uh, to Damascus experience, a Damascus road experience in verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, uh, why do you persecute me? All of a sudden, as he's on the road, as he's nearing uh, the city, uh, he has this bright light, brighter than uh, the midday sun, it says elsewhere. And so he falls to the ground and he hears a voice. He hears a voice of the Lord Jesus. Jesus saying in verse 4, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, this was not a vision. This is not a vision uh, that Saul has. This is an appearance. This is the risen Lord Jesus, who we've said has risen and ascended into heaven. He has now appeared. If you remember the story of the transfiguration, when he's sort of shining bright, this is this. Uh, God is uh, described as dwelling in an approachable light. That Paul tells us that in one of his letters. This is God coming. God the Son appearing to him on that road, on that dusty road, with blinding light. That's why he can't see anything. God dwells in unapproachable light. And yet, of course, he hears the voice. It goes on to say in verse 7, the other men, uh, they, they don't see the Lord Jesus, but they hear the voice. This was a personal appearance to Saul, but it was a public appearance as well. It was a public uh, manifestation, a public religious experience that he had. It wasn't a sort of private thing, a sort of a gut feeling that he had, a sort of inner conviction that he developed, an inner prompting. No, this was sudden, this was dramatic, this was public. This was an appearance of the risen Lord Jesus. It's not like verse 10. In verse 10, there's a disciple called Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias doesn't have the risen Lord Jesus appear to him in that way. He has a vision to see something, a vision of Jesus. But here with Saul, uh, the risen uh, Lord Jesus comes and appears to him. He comes physically uh, to him. Uh, Saul's experience was different even to that of Ananias. And there's no doubting what could happen, or what had happened. This was a Christophany, an appearance of the risen Lord Jesus uh, to one of his disciples. And Saul's life would never be the same again. Saul was transformed from this moment on. But look at what Jesus says to him. He appears, he falls to the ground. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Isn't that interesting? Who is Saul persecuting? Well, you may say it was the church, but Jesus says, why do you persecute me? Jesus is identifying with his people. The church is the body of Christ. We are united, joined to him, and therefore opposing the church is opposing Jesus. He is persecuting Christ himself. Jesus says to his followers, if they reject you, they reject me. That is what Saul is doing. He's identifying with his people here, the Lord Jesus, that he too is being persecuted as his, as his church uh, are being persecuted. He's identifying with them, but he's also protecting them because in this moment, he's changing the heart of someone. He's changing the heart of someone who's their worst enemy in that sense. Their worst persecutor is now being transformed. The Lord Jesus is adding to the church in appearing uh, to Saul. And at this point, Saul is converted. He falls to the ground. Uh, he, uh, you see in verse 9, he says, uh, For three days he was blind. He did not eat or drink anything. Saul is converted at this point. He says to him, Who are you, Lord? That may just be a, Who are you, sir? Um, but it is clear when uh, the reply is, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And the fact there's a blinding light as if it's from heaven and he's fallen to the ground. He knows who this is now. And the fact that he fasts, he doesn't eat or drink uh, for three days, shows his repentance. Uh, he is repenting 
uh, of his sins. Uh, he has humility. He's been born again. And the irony here is that now he can't physically see, he can spiritually see. He's been blinded, and yet actually his eyes have been opened in that true sense. He now knows who Jesus is. He's a changed man as a result. That's why he fasts. He has spiritual sight. Now, it was interesting this morning we looked at the book of Jonah. This is entirely coincidental from our planning. But in Jonah chapter 2, there's a fascinating bit in Jonah chapter 2 where Jonah says, salvation belongs to the Lord, or salvation comes from the Lord. It's a great uh, declaration that Jonah makes. It's uh, featured in the Psalms as well. It's a great phrase, salvation belongs to the Lord. It's his gift. It's what the Lord brings. It's his initiative. And Saul is surely the clearest example that we ever have of that. Salvation comes, it originates, it's with the initiative of God. It's his work. God has changed his heart. You see, Saul is not like the eunuch we saw last week. The eunuch was someone who was uh, drawn along, who was interested. God had brought him along to Jerusalem. He'd brought him to a stage where he was reading Isaiah. He brought him to a stage where he was open. And then Philip came and he preached the gospel and it was like the final straw. Saul is not like that. Saul is not a seeker. He's not open to the gospel. He is opposed to the gospel. And yet in that minute, just like that, he was converted. Why? Because the risen Lord Jesus appeared to him. He transformed his heart. He changed him. Salvation belongs to the Lord. But the good news for us is that means that no one is beyond God's power. You think of your friends or your family or your loved ones, your neighbors, perhaps even those who might seem so hardened so anti-gospel, so opposed to it, so uninterested, so hostile, and yet there is no heart that's too hard for Jesus to soften. There's no one who is too far away, too far removed, that God couldn't change their heart, that God couldn't transform them, that they couldn't be born again and come into a relationship with God through his son Jesus. It's a reminder not to give up not to give up praying, to give up speaking. God changed the life of Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor of the church. And actually, this conversion is a great picture of the gospel because Saul was literally an enemy, an enemy of God. And yet in the gospel, enemies are made friends. We've been reconciled to God. Having formerly been hostile, now reconciled, through the blood of Christ. All of us by nature are hostile to God, perhaps not in the same way that Saul was, but his conversion is a great picture of the gospel. Those who oppose Jesus, who are enemies of God, can become his friends, can be saved, can be transformed in that moment, and it's all of his work. It's a sudden conversion by the grace of God. Now I want you to think if you're here this evening and you know that you're a Christian, I want you to think about how you became a Christian, just in your mind now. How did you become a follower of Jesus? What was it for you? For me, there was a, a particular day. I'd heard lots of stuff about Jesus in the past. It was all slowly falling into place. And there was one moment where I remember, yeah, I'm going to trust in Jesus now. I'm going to pray. I'm going to call on his name. For many people, of course, they don't, have, they don't know what day they were born again. They know they have been born again, but they don't know when it was. It, it was some time. Perhaps it was a gradual thing. Uh, perhaps it was so long ago you can't exactly remember when it was. But you know that you're a Christian. You know that you're believing in Jesus. Everyone's story of how they became a Christian is different. And that's a wonderful thing. But I bet it wasn't like this. I bet it wasn't like with a bright flash knocking you to the floor, blind for three days, with a voice speaking to you. It wasn't like this. And that's the point. It was out of the ordinary. It was extraordinary. And that's because there's a reason for that. It takes us to the next uh, stage of the story. A surprising commission. A surprising commission. Verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple 
named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now, you can imagine what Ananias is feeling, as we'll get to that in a moment. He's probably feeling a little bit nervous when he hears the name of the person he's got to go to. But this serves as a sort of double confirmation. It wasn't just Saul's say-so that he had seen a light. This is, you know, this is the two or three witnesses, as it might describe in the Old Testament. Uh, the Lord Jesus gives a vision to confirm what has happened, a vision to somebody else. But you can see and you can understand, verse 13... Ananias' hesitation. I've heard many reports, he says, about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. It's understandable. He's a bit hesitant. He knows the reputation of Saul. But of course, when the Lord Jesus says something, you do it. It changes things. And so uh, what does he do? He welcomes Saul. Verse 17 there's a wonderful uh, bit in verse 17. Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul. Isn't that lovely? This is a man who's a persecutor of the church. He's his enemy. But he's been born again. He's part of the church. And therefore, he's his family. He's a spiritual sibling. He's his brother. It's extraordinary. God's people are brothers and sisters together. And it's interesting that the person who more than anyone talks about God's people being brothers and sisters, who refers to Christians as brothers, brothers and sisters, is the Apostle Paul in his letters. But he's been embraced, welcomed into the family. Brother Saul, it's remarkable. A man who was a, a persecutor of the church is now actually his brother in Christ. He welcomes him in. Welcomed and embraced. Now, um, back in the springtime, when war between uh, Ukraine and Russia was uh, beginning, there happened to be a conference at the same time, a conference that was happening for teenagers called Global Revival. I don't know anything about the conference, so I have to give that disclaimer as I say the name of it. Um, but it was a conference where there were people, uh, teenagers, from across Eastern Europe. And these are pictures. They're not particularly good. They're a bit grainy taken from Facebook, of teenagers, Ukrainian and Russian teenagers, praising God together. As their countries came to war, as Russia invaded, Ukrainian and Russian teenagers were worshipping together, were brothers and sisters in the Lord, praising him together. It's what the gospel does. The gospel brings people from different families, different ethnicities, even enemies, humanly speaking, and yet are brought together, have been reconciled together in Christ to be part of his family. Brothers and sisters in the gospel. And Ananias and Saul experienced that. And so uh, Ananias goes, uh, he speaks to him, uh, he, is, uh, he can see again, verse 18, immediately something like scales uh, fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained uh, his uh, strength. He goes to see him and uh, he is welcomed and embraced. But the key thing for us I want to uh, point out is the commission that Saul has, the commission that has come through Ananias, verse 15. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Saul is God's man for the job. The Lord Jesus has specifically chosen Saul to be his chosen instrument be his means of grace, to be an apostle, an apostle to the Gentiles, uh, Paul describes himself, an apostle to all people, including Israel, uh, it says here. Now, this is important 
Because if you can remember back, I think, in January time, when we did Acts chapter 1, you can all remember, I'm sure, everything I said in that sermon back in January time. In Acts chapter 1, we saw that the replacement of Judas, there was, a, there was a criteria. One of the criteria was they had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. If you wanted to be an apostle, you needed to have been an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus. And that, of course, is exactly what Saul is. Why? Because he's seen, he's encountered the risen Lord Jesus. He is an eyewitness to that. That's why he's an apostle. He's an apostle in that same sense. And as the gospel goes out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, the person who's going to take it to the ends of the earth, to the Gentiles, is Saul and others, but Saul. That's his job, to take the task of taking the gospel of the risen Lord Jesus to the ends of the earth now. That's going to be Saul's job. And that commission will, in verse 16, it will involve suffering. In the same way that he's dished it out, he will receive it. Followers of the Lord Jesus will suffer. You follow a crucified uh, Messiah. But this is a surprise, isn't it? It's hard for us to perhaps get our heads around the surprise because you know the story. And perhaps if you've read the New Testament, you'll remember that this is Paul. We know the story. And yet this is a huge surprise. Not just is he converted, that's a surprise, but he's commissioned with the task of taking the gospel out. That's a huge surprise that God would not just save the bloke, but then use him as his chosen vessel and his chosen vessel to the Gentiles. It's extraordinary grace and mercy. But that is also true for us. It is also extraordinary grace and mercy for us, not in the sense that we're apostles, but the same word that's used here as chosen instruments is the word that Paul himself uses in 2 Corinthians 4 to refer to Christians. Uh, vessels, he says, earthen vessels, jars of clay. It's the same word, vessels. Vessels for God's glory. Chosen instrument, it's translated here. That's our job as well. Not in exactly the same way, but still to reflect God's glory. To show the world the glory and the beauty of the gospel. To take it out to our friends, our family. To live for him in a secular world. It's our task, as well as the Apostle Paul's. And you never know what God might call you to do. What God might be leading you to do. Perhaps it's something surprising. This would have been a very surprising thing that Saul was commissioned to do. A few days earlier, he could never have imagined being in this situation. Maybe there is something surprising that God is opening the door for you. Some ministry area, perhaps. Some opportunity. Perhaps a role at work, a, a new change that will bring you in contact with other people. If you haven't planned for it, if you weren't expecting it, perhaps you don't even feel particularly equipped for it. And yet you are the sort of chosen instrument, the vessel in that sense. Because although Saul was one of the brightest minds in human history, and although he was very well theologically trained, his job was to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He wasn't an expert on Gentile culture. Just think about it. Last week we saw the Ethiopian eunuch who was going to the ends of the earth, going back home. He might have been an obvious choice, right? to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, not this Jewish uh, Pharisee, Saul. But it was God's plan. God was going to use him. So even if we don't feel particularly confident, even if uh, perhaps we don't feel particularly suitable, and we think there's other people who might be uh, better at reaching those people or, or being involved in that area, we're not to despair, are we? We're jars of clay, vessels, but vessels that God will use that God is glorified through, uh, that he'll use to bring honor to his name. It was a surprising commission. Then thirdly and finally, uh, we see a strengthened church. A strengthened church. Now, it's often said, isn't it, that the best people to share the gospel of Jesus are those who are sort of new converts. They're the people who are the most excited about the gospel, and they're the ones who are the most fearless. And that's what we see here. Verse 20 
at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Verse 22, it says, Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, understandably, this causes a bit of a fuss. You can see that in verse 21. It causes uh, some surprise. Saul is using his gifting, his skills, his ability, his intellect. He's becoming more powerful. He's being strengthened, not to oppose the gospel, but to preach the gospel, to strengthen the church, to bless the church, uh, not to persecute it. And verse 22, when it talks about uh, him proving that Jesus is the Messiah, that proving language is the sort of persuading people. It's the joining of dots. He's sort of showing people all these promises in the Old Testament, how that Christ is promised or offered uh, to the people in various types and uh, shadows in the sacrificial system and so on. He's showing how Jesus is the focus of the Old Testament and the New Testament, to use slightly anachronistic language there. But he's showing how their scriptures were pointing to Jesus. He's joining the dots and proving that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. He's proving it to them. He's doing that evangelistically, but of course it's strengthening the church, isn't it? Think for a second of uh, perhaps Paul's letters. Perhaps think about a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. Romans or Ephesians or Colossians or whatever it is. Think of the rich theology. Think of all the ways that Paul alludes to the Old Testament. Think of all the ways that he draws the dots, that he explains the gospel, that he applies the gospel to Jew and Gentile through the Old Testament scriptures. This is where it begins. This is where he's growing in strength. This is his training ground. And as Saul is proclaiming the gospel, as he's sharing that, this is strengthening the church, isn't it? Saul's commission strengthens God's church. I mean, just think for a second. It's almost impossible to imagine. Think of all the ways that God has blessed the church in the last 2,000 years through Paul's writings. All the Christians who have been strengthened in their faith through his words. It's impossible to understand. And yet God was strengthening the church uh, through Saul's uh, ministry. It starts here. It leads to opposition. We see that in verse 21. We see it in verse 23 and 24 of a conspiracy. We see it in verse 29. They try to kill him. He has to be lowered down in a basket to be saved. This is no airbrushed history. There was opposition. People opposed the message. They didn't like what uh, Paul has to say. It didn't stop him, though, does it? Verse 28. He stayed with the disciples, moved back freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. And it's no wonder at the end of this little bit, in verse 31, Luke's summary, as he writes it, is that the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria, enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. It's no surprise. After Saul's conversion, the church is strengthened. It's healthy. It's growing. It's not just that the Lord Jesus has got rid of a persecutor. He's actually positively using that for good, to strengthen the church. And the church is growing in the fear of the Lord. A fear of the Lord that is not, uh, in that sense, a terror of the Lord. What does it say in verse 31? Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Spirit. It's a sort of an awe-filled rejoicing, a right sort of trembling, but a sort of awe-filled love and rejoicing and encouragement that the Spirit has brought, a fear of the Lord, rejoicing and trembling. And it's through, after, as a result of Saul's conversion, Saul's commission. And it leads to great unity in the church. Verse 31 It says, the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria, enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Multiple geographic locations there. Multiple locations. How many churches? One. One church. 
of Jesus Christ. Lots of locations in that sense, lots of local congregations, but one church, a unity uh, of his people. And that church is being strengthened because the risen Lord Jesus has commissioned Saul to proclaim the gospel. And so as we come to uh, a close, that is still happening today. The strengthening of the church comes through the ministry of Saul. Now we call him Paul. He changes his name in Acts, as we'll see. It comes through, not just through Paul, but it comes through Paul's writing. And of course, even today, some people have different responses to Paul's ministry. Some people want to write off the Apostle Paul and his letters in the New Testament as outdated, to perhaps to minimize his words, to want to draw a wedge between Jesus and Paul. I remember uh, a while back seeing somebody who I sort of knew on Twitter. It's always bad to go on Twitter, but somebody I knew on Twitter who was actually a minister of a church. And she had said, uh, she was criticizing the Apostle Paul, not that he was reading it, I'm sure, but she was criticizing the Apostle Paul, dismissing him as being misogynistic and outdated, too wedded to the sort of first century culture. And you, you hear Christians say that. We like Jesus, we like his teachings. Paul's stuff is, seems different, it seems harder, it seems harsher, particularly on areas of sexuality and gender, people say. But it can't be the case, can it? Why? Well, verse 15, Jesus says, this man is my chosen instrument. The risen Lord Jesus specifically called and commissioned Paul to proclaim the gospel, to write as his mouthpiece, to be his spokesperson. As Paul writes the, a huge part of the rest of the New Testament, that is the risen Lord Jesus speaking, communicating, strengthening his church. And it's true for us today at Swindon Evangelical Church. If we listen to the words of his apostles, Paul included, but not just Paul, if we listen to his words, there is great blessing and strengthening from the risen Lord Jesus. But we have to listen.